This is The Dragon's Roar by Priestess of Groove, narrated by Riley Rocks. Chapter 13 Jamie 4 The following day found Jamie in Winterfell's solar, trying very hard not to glare at Ned Stark. He now understood why he had been so furious with Aemon the day before. His friend had left him tied to the bed, naked, in favor of chasing down his damned sister. It was Ned Stark who had untied him. Ned fucking Stark had now seen him at his absolute worst. It was enough to make him want to vomit. Again. The old wounds at being called the Kingslayer had reopened as well. It was just as it was before. Jamie was shamed and scorned for killing a king that everyone had wanted dead anyway. But Ned Stark had gotten away with hiding his nephew and lying to Westeros. No one had thought much of the bastard being a blemish on Ned's honor, even before then. Since Aemon's existence had just come to light, it would be some time before he'd know how the realm reacted to Ned Stark's treachery. But he had a feeling he wouldn't suffer the way that he had. Sir Jamie, I wanted to thank you for saving my son, Rob. It was a gallant thing to do and proved how worthy you are to be a knight. Ned Stark said. His voice was a calm blue, as deep as the ocean, and somehow it irritated Jamie even further than he should sound so calm. He snorted at that. <laughs> You're famous for your honesty, Lord Stark, so don't lie now. Don't act like you're getting your teeth pulled. His own voice was the color of fire, and he wanted nothing more than for it to somehow burn Lord Stark. Ned sighed in frustration. <sighs> I did not lie. I am truly thankful for what you did for my son, and it truly was worthy of a knight. But you don't think I'm a worthy knight. King Aemon has pardoned you of that. I think we can let it go. Can we? I do believe I'm still known as the Kingslayer everywhere in Westeros. Jo <clears throat> Aemon has suggested that I may have been wrong in my judgment of you. Jamie crossed his arms and stared down at Ned imperiously from his place by the wall. He didn't bother trying to hide his glare any more. I'm prepared to make amends with you. For the sake of my nephew, he trusts you, and I want to trust you too. There is nothing that I can say that will change your mind. You made it up about me a long time ago. The only thing that will satisfy you is if I kept to my duty and you killed me on the way to murder old King Scab. Just know this, Lord Stark. If I were informed that my entire family would be put to death if I killed King Eris, including myself, I would have still shoved my sword into his back. The consequences upon myself be damned. Jamie growled, not unlike the lion that the Lannisters wore. Ned's eyes widened at his declaration. He opened his mouth to say more, but just then there was a knock at the door, and Eamon walked in. "'Your Grace,' Jamie said with a formal bow. "'Your Grace,' Ned said, giving a nod of his head. Eamon studied them for a moment, seeming to know that the tensions were high, and then he said, "'I apologize for my tardiness.' I was consulting with Sir Barristan about the King's Guard schedule and who we might promote to the empty spots. You need not explain yourself. You were the king, after all, Jamie said. But a shadow fell over his face at the mention of the King's Guard spots. At dinner, Eamon had declared that Jamie's injuries now prevented him from serving faithfully in the King's Guard, and he was furthermore honorably discharged from the position. It was then he also formally pardoned Jamie for the king's slang of his grandfather, 
citing the atrocious crimes the kings had committed as enough reason for the king to be dealt with as quickly as possible. It was a declaration that had been met with muttering, but despite being accurately referred to as the kingslayer for so long, everyone was in agreement that the mad king had deserved to die. It's polite, Eamon insisted. Now, we need to plot out our next steps. We have the jump on the entire kingdom, and, uncle, as grateful as I am for your support, we need more than just the support of the north. It won't take long for the rest of the kingdom to hear that you've summoned the lords of the north. I want to be open about my motivations. The ruling houses of Westeros should hear from me first that I have claimed the throne, and I already hold the old king hostage. Be careful, Aemon. You may have taken the biggest players out, but the Game of Thrones is still being played out cautiously, Jamie said. I'm aware. Uncle, tell me, can I expect support from the Vale and the Riverlands? You should, Ned replied. I was well known and liked in the Vale. Naturally, the Tullys will support you, since Rob is your cousin and ally. I want to be sure. Please send letters to them on my behalf. I'll be happy to include a missive if it might win their trust more easily. Very well. Robert may have been John Aaron's ward as well, but although the kingdom has been at peace, the little I've heard from Robert suggests that it's been poorly managed. He was a shit king, Lord Stark. He left the ruling to the council and just drank and hoard his kingdom away, Jamie said coolly. Ned glared at him. Robert was a good man once, but you're right. He was always ill-suited to rule. Jamie, what do you know of the rest of the kingdoms? You're asking me this. Tyrion knows how politics works better than I. Maybe he should be here. Aemon gave him a wry look. As much as I like Tyrion, I'm not quite ready to trust him with this sensitive information. You're not as uninformed as you think, either. Tell me. Well, um... Uh... The Reach and Dorne backed the Targaryens during the rebellion, promised them a worthy marriage, and the Tyrells will leap to your aid. I'll see about convincing my father to turn over Sir Gregor Clegane and Sir Armory Lorch. The Martells will be on good terms with you for allowing them justice for Elia Martell and her children. Another marriage offer wouldn't go amiss either. However, I am your closest ally, and they despise the Lannisters. That's where you might run into trouble. Do I even need to ask about the Westerlands? Jamie barked out a laugh. Not only did you save my father's golden heir's head, but you have raised me from the king's guard, allowing me to take my place as the heir he's always wanted. He may very well grovel at your feet, and that's a tall order from my father. There was a note of bitterness to his voice. Eamon smiled at him. I know you have no interest in being heir to Casterly Rock, but I did not release you from the King's Guard for your injuries alone. You are my most trusted ally. I need you in a position to work in tandem with me. I understand, Aemon, but you and I know better than most how dangerous the Game of Thrones is. I'd prefer to be by your side, Jamie said. I have Sir Barristan, and I will be traveling with the Northern Army. I could think of a few more capable, nor trustworthy. I want to send letters to the Reach in Dorne. But I want you to go there and do the actual negotiating. What? Jamie and Ned both said at the same time. Jamie was aghast, and Ned was appalled. Your Grace. Uncle, you can call me by my name. No need to stand on formalities in a private room. Of course, Eamon. Do you really trust Sir Jamie Lannister with something like this? This is your kingdom we're talking about. Am I not trustworthy enough for you, Lord Stark? Jamie growled at Ned. Eamon also glared at his uncle. 
Jamie has a far better grasp and understanding of the situation than you, uncle. I trust him to negotiate on my behalf. The Tyrells and the Martells must know that I am not talking to them lightly. Jamie, you will act on my behalf as Hand of the King. The silence after Eamon's proclamation was so complete, Jamie could swear he heard the drops of moisture on the damp stone in the Stark's family crypt. Me? The Hand of the King? Jamie's voice was practically squeaked. His normally blue voice had turned lime green at the pitch. He cleared his throat and said in a more natural voice, <clears throat> You can't be serious. Of course I'm serious. I need you to have the power necessary to act on my behalf. With these negotiations, you'll be making decisions that impact the kingdom. The Tyrells and the Martells have to know that you're in a position of authority. I could think of no better person. Your Grace, Amen. You can trust me to negotiate on your behalf, Ned said, sounding more than a little desperate as his voice changed to a wavering purple. Jamie clenched his teeth and scowled at Ned. Eamon scowled, too. Uncle, it has nothing to do with trust and everything to do with knowledge. It would take far too much time to explain everything to you. Jamie knows. He lived it with me. He has also been living in King's Landing for the last fifteen years, and he is the only person I trust with the handling of the Game of Thrones. I hate to say it, Uncle, but you know very little about what it takes to keep a throne. You'll need a good reason for making me hand. We're not supposed to know each other, Jamie replied. Eamon tapped his chin as he thought for a moment and then said, the official reasoning will be that I made you hand so I could have access to Lannister resources. And since outwardly, I saved your life. You owe me a debt. Jamie raised his eyebrows. If I didn't know any better, I'd say you've been giving lessons from Tyrion. Cunning. I like it. However, I must protest in regards to the Martells. They will have my head if I try to negotiate with them, because of your half-brother and sister. I suppose it's not enough that you didn't kill them. No. Hmm. That's a shame. I was hoping to have Doran by the time I take King's Landing. We can take it without them, but that'll have to wait, Eamon said. Do still send them Sir Gregor Clegane and Sir Armory Lurch as a gesture of goodwill. With pleasure. Jamie, I want you to write a letter to your father this evening. Tell him of the events. Make sure he doesn't attack King's Landing. You leave tomorrow for Barrowtown to take a ship to Lannisport to meet with your father. Tomorrow? The maester said he was going to take my stitches out in five days. Damn. Then I want you on a horse as soon as Maester Lewin has removed your stitches. Then you'll visit the Reach. I will write the letters to the Tyrells, the Martells, the Stormlands, and Pike. What kind of reception can I get from the Baratheon brothers and Greyjoy? Lord Jamie, Uncle? Jamie and Ned glanced at each other. When Ned nodded, Jamie began. I think you know not to expect a warm welcome from them. The Stormlands can boast a decent force, but not as large as the Westerlands or the North. I highly recommend you send your letters to the Reach tonight. Take advantage of your time. King's Landing is the seat of kings, and I imagine Renly is going to move into the city and prepare it for siege. Can you be a king of the Seven Kingdoms without the seat of power? They'll do their damnness to hold it from you. I would agree with Sir... <clears throat> I mean... Lord Jamie's assessment regarding Renly's response. Be cautious of Stannis, Eamon. He is an excellent military commander. Do not underestimate him. He also has the Red Priestess with him. We have to stop her before she does any permanent damage, Jamie said. She's going to try and make him king. 
But Robert's our hostage. He's not dead. Stannis cannot declare himself king until Robert's death is confirmed, Ned interjected. Agreed. Let's keep Robert alive for as long as possible. You should probably limit his wine intake, then. He's been drinking himself into an early grave for better than a decade, Jamie muttered. I'll be doing a number of things to make sure Robert stays alive, including rationing his food to a normal portion. He may be a nobleman, but he's still a prisoner, and he should not be allowed the luxury to indulge like a king, Eamon said. What about Greyjoy? We have Theon as a hostage for a reason, Ned said. I don't trust Balon Greyjoy to act in the best interests of the realm. Balon can't be trusted, and neither can any of his brothers, Jamie said. If you want the fully cooperative support of Pike, then assassinate Balon and his brothers and install Theon as a leader. Jamie, we both know that the people of Pike would never allow that. They have their own system of electing a leader. Hmm. Then allow Theon to fight and prove himself, or put your support behind Yara Greyjoy and leave Theon by the wayside. I'm assuming you're interested in the Pike fleet, Jamie asked. I am. It would be a most useful tool. Jamie chuckled and shook his head. <laughs> Good luck trying to control them. I have little doubt there'll be a thorn in my side if I don't do as you suggest in regards to installing Theon or Yara. But the people of Pike are a stubborn lot. They are pirates because they have no industry. Nothing of value can be found on those islands, Ned said. We need to find a way for them to be able to grow the resources they need on their own. Or we could relocate them somewhere else in the Seven Kingdoms, Eamon suggested, though he didn't sound hopeful. Despite living on a spit of a rock, I imagine the people there are just as attached to their land as the northerners are to our land, he sighed. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Let's focus on what we can do in the coming weeks. Let's discuss marriages. Any suggestions? Offer the Tyrells your cousin Rob, Jamie said. The Reach is the breadbasket of Westeros. The North will need that food supply when the long night comes. That's a good idea. Do you think they'll go for it? I would insist upon it. Mace Tyrell is a fool, and he'll try to play up the support of your family to insist his daughter be queen. He mismanaged his resources, and what could have been an easy win against Stannis, he instead allowed your uncle to break his army's back. He doesn't deserve to have his daughter placed on the throne. I think... Olena Tyrell will be amenable, Jamie replied neutrally, though his frown deepened. They will need to be handled carefully... He was thinking back to when Olena confessed to poisoning Joffrey, and thereby creating the events that led to all of his bastard children and Lord Tywin to their deaths. Since I'm going to be the one negotiating on your behalf, do I have permission to offer Sansa Stark to the heir, Willis Tyrell? Now, Sir Jamie, we're talking about my daughter. Who loves songs and the knights who rescue fair maidens. He may not be much of a knight, but he raises hounds and horses, and I think she'd quite enjoy High Garden, Jamie replied. He thought back to his other life when he'd heard that the Tyrells were working to marry Sansa to Willis, until his lord father caught wind of it and instantly married her to his brother instead. Cripple and all, He's certain Sansa would have been much happier married into the Tyrells, not least because it took her away from her primary source of misery, King's Landing. Eamon, are you sure about this? I never met Willis Tyrell, but I heard good things about him. He was killed when the Lannisters took Highgarden. Much to my chagrin, Jamie muttered. Cersei wouldn't have it any other way. 
That's why we're not allowing her anywhere near power. Eamon finished the thought. Ned's eyes went wide at the small sidetrack in conversation, but Eamon shot him a look that suggested they would talk later. I was thinking, do you think Arya would do well in Dorne? They train their women to fight, Jamie said, giving him a knowing look. You might be able to seal their alliance with just Sir Gregor's head. If they don't bite, I may offer her hand in marriage to Tristane, Martell. I want her to live there at least a year before officially sealing it. I don't want her to be miserable. That can be arranged, Jamie replied. Uncle, I would like your input on this. These are your children, after all, Eamon said. Med was quiet for a moment, and he was obviously miffed. I don't like the thought of Arya being on the other side of the continent. However, you do put forth a good argument that she might be happier among people who would indulge her desire to fight. What I don't understand is why neither of you are offering yourselves. Both of you would be highly eligible bachelors. Jamie huffed. First of all, Marjorie Tyrell is only a year older than your eldest daughter. I will not marry a child. Second, do you really want the second most powerful house of Westeros marrying the first most powerful house? Even if I had no desire for the throne, Marjorie Tyrell and her family do. Even if nothing happens in our lifetime, the next generation could potentially make a bid for Aemon's throne. I will not allow that. She's safer up in the north as Rob's lady wife. And what of you, nephew? What's your reason? Eamon raised his eyebrows and said, I have every intention of marrying Daenerys Targaryen. Your aunt? Do you think that wise? We will need her for the long night. What of Viserys? He was never stable, even when he was a child, Jamie said. He'll be a problem. That's presuming he's still alive by the time I meet with Daenerys, Eamon said, frowning slightly. I'm not going to worry about that right now. First, I would prefer to secure the throne and unite the Seven Kingdoms. Let's focus on that for now. You have your orders. I want those letters sent no later than this evening. Lord Jamie, if you would stay a moment. Ned hesitated at the door, but then he nodded and left. I don't care what my uncle cares much for me taking over his solar. I think having the run of Winterfell previously went to my head, Eamon said, grimacing. I'm not the best at writing, Eamon, so if you have something to say, then do it, Jamie said. Eamon nodded and dropped his voice so low that Jamie had to lean in to hear him. You can see sounds again, can't you? Jamie sighed and nodded. That's another reason why I've made you hand. It'll be much harder for people to hide their intentions, and I think you'll have a much easier time negotiating because of it. You are probably right. But I've never had to be a diplomat before. I know. But I still need you in this capacity. We both know my uncle, in all likelihood, will negotiate from a position of mutual trust. I want you to negotiate from a position of power. The North is formidable, and few people want to cross your father without good reason. Use that power, but gently. We don't need to make enemies. I understand, Jamie replied, though there was a spite of impatience to his voice. I want to tell you my schedule, so that you might be able to reach me by Raven. When the Northern Lords get here, I intend to ride to Castle Black. I want to speak to Lord Commander Gior Mormont about the Long Night, and also... I want to speak to my great-granduncle. I forgot he was there. He might be valuable. Eamon nodded. Right. 
from Castle Black, I will return to Winterfell and then head to Moat Caelan, then cross to the Twins and stay at River Run for a few weeks to gather the Vale. From there, I should probably head to King's Landing so that I can take the throne. I expect to be at King's Landing's doors in three to four months, depending on how slow the army moves. It'll be slow. Expect to be there in five months. And for the record, I'm not sending a single raven to Walder fucking Frey. He's best assassinated if you want my opinion. I just can't assassinate lords because I find them untrustworthy. We both know that. And no matter how dim-witted I find Edmure Tully, I can at least trust he has enough integrity to not read your messages. Agreed. Will that be all? What of Lord Baelish? For the first time since becoming king, Aemon looked uncertain. He's the only lord I have no reservations about killing. If you can detain him or pretend to work with him, do so. He's probably one of the few people who's going to know about the events of yesterday in a matter of weeks. Just like last time, he's going to convince Lysa Arryn to keep her forces from joining us. Not all of them. Lord Johann Royce commands a great deal of respect in the Vale. He might be willing to forsake Lysa's words. I wouldn't guarantee it. At any rate, if we can snag the Reach, the Riverlands, the Westerlands, and, of course, the North, that's four of the Seven Kingdoms. You'll still be formidable, and at some point the other kingdoms will have to bend. One can only hope it'll be that simple. Eamon nodded. Just as Jamie opened the door, he called out, Thank you for doing this. Jamie hesitated for a moment, then closed the door again and said, I didn't want to say this in front of your uncle, but it could be equally dangerous proposing Marjorie Tyrell and Rob Mary. Until you finally have an heir, you are vulnerable. Until Daenerys Targaryen reaches Westeros, Rob will be your heir. That could tempt the Tyrells into trying to kill you. Aemon nodded grimly. I admit I hadn't thought of that. It'd be easier if you married the Tyrell girl. I'm sure we can find a bride for you just as easily, Aemon replied with narrowed eyes. Jamie grimaced. That's why I suggested Rob, not you. We both deserve a chance to be with the ones we love. If they love us back, Jamie wanted to finish, but let it hang in the air. Neither one wanted to think about the woman they loved not loving them back. Jamie tried to push the thought to the back of his mind as he left. He had to focus or he'd never get anywhere near Brienne.